And we are live here on the Mark Goldberg channel. Thank you for joining me, ladies and gentlemen. Let me just kind of line myself up a little bit and explain what we're going to do today. This is an impromptu video in which I would like to discuss with you the various ways that you might purchase Rolex a bit cheaper than normal, or at least I should say the way I do. Now, this is a live stream, which will be posted up to YouTube. So if you are not watching it live, but you're watching it a little bit later, and if the preliminary introductions of uh, people who filter their way into the uh, chat room, et cetera, if this stuff annoys you, just scrub ahead a few minutes, and we'll be jumping right into the actual topic uh, matter at hand. Okay. In fact, let's kind of get to that you know, pretty quickly, but I'm just going to wait a few minutes and greet the punters as they come in. So yeah, just scrub ahead. Bud to stud and Val and Grey Moon, just, uh, I would say about tying for first, although Bud, you actually kind of, you might have hit the uh, return button right before Valen, but the two of you are man, um, men among men. <laughs> anyway, thank you for being with me, guys. Um, so uh, Flabber, I love you, Marky. Well, I love all you guys. Thank you so much for being with me. Um, okay, look. The topic of Rolex, is it worn out? Is it done? I don't know. Guys, I've been so exhausted. Let, exhausted with watches a little bit. Let me show you what I've been wearing a lot. Hold on. Coming back. I just got to slide over here to the watch box. And I got to tell you, I, I, I spent like two weeks wearing this night and day in the shower, sleeping, working, literally everything. This is this is what's known as the Casio Royale. It costs $30 <laughs> US on Amazon. It does everything you want. It's got five, five, <laughs> what do you call it? Like five world time zones, uh, uh, a light, a backlight, and, um, and a 10 year battery. So it, it's just, this is the most fun that you can have with a watch for cheap. I highly recommend that everybody get one. But anyway, I wore this for like a couple of weeks just because I just, I don't know, I, I got absolutely exhausted um, trying to rotate watches and and thinking what I wanted to wear and what I wanted to sell. And I don't know, it's just been a very, I, I probably need therapy, okay? The guy, one of the first guys who actually brought me into this watch collecting madness was uh, Jeff McMahon. And, and uh, he calls us watch obsessives. And um, it, it, it it's so true. There really is definitively, there is something wrong with us. And I am, I am, I am, I am right there next to you. I need therapy as well. So I just got emotionally OCD'd out, exhausted, trying to figure out what I wanted to do with watches. And so, you know, I wore this little $30 watch for quite a long time. But then, you know, naturally the, the sirens song started singing to me, Rolex, put on a Rolex, come crash against the rocks. <laughs> you know, um, just like in Greek mythology, how Odysseus would hear the siren song and he just managed to escape barely with his life. And um, I, for me, watch collecting is both a joy. It's fun. It's a community. It brings us together. We get to um, compare our experiences. But at the same time, it, it, it's a little bit of a, a trap. There, there's quite a bit of quicksand that's also involved. Um because we can become fixated. We can dedicate too much energy to figuring out what do we want to do with the collection? What should we buy? What should we sell? What should we wear? What should we rotate? Um, it can become uh, just utterly exhausting. And, and it did. So, uh, you know, I wore my cheapie there for a while and then I decided to pull out a Rolex. What did I do? I pulled out like three or four of them, started rotating them like mad, went right back to the insanity. And then I thought, no, 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 no. I've got to I've got to calm this down a little bit. So I'm going to do a quick fist watch check right now. And I'm going to show you, this is what I am wearing. This is a Rolex Submariner. And I want to talk to you in this video about the buying experience and how I bought it, what I paid for it, just kind of like how that all went down. But I want to tell you the reason that I'm wearing it is to my, to my way of thinking, the Rolex Submariner is one of the most basic watches that you could wear. Um, it would compare favorably in that category, maybe to a, uh, maybe to a date just. Um, and in, in some sense, it's probably less flashy than a date just because a lot of the date just are two-tone. They have the fluted bezel, whether it's white gold or yellow gold, they catch the light. Whereas this is all, you know, primarily matte. There's a little bit of high polish on the, on the flanks, but mostly matte finish. And um, I decided to wear this because usually this watch, to be quite frank, normally the, the black ceramic Rolex Submariner, which is what this is, normally it kind of bores me. 
And uh, we'll talk that through first and then we'll get into the whole you know, buying experience and I'll tell you how I bought it and, 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 and how I recommend that you, if you'd like to buy a real Rolex for real cheap, how you might do it. So um, why does it bore me? Well, you know, people complain all the time that Rolex is going to get them robbed. Super chat. We have a super chat. Tank Williams, $2. Thank you, Tank. If you had, uh, you know, anything you wanted to say or, you know, yeah, for two bucks, I'm happy to address it. <clears throat> but anyway, thank you so much. Look, um, people complain all the time that they don't want to wear a Rolex, you know, sub to the office because people are going to be looking at it, thinking things about them, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I, you know, guys, I, nobody notices this watch. If you have had experiences to the contrary where, you know, people like, oh, you're wearing a Rolex, you know, and looked at your sub and gave you a hassle for it. You know, let's talk about that in the comments, whether it be live or posted up here. Talk to me in the comments about your experiences wearing a sub, because I'm going to tell you mine. Nobody notices this thing. Nobody. I mean, this is essentially basic watch. Now, I understand that it's very expensive. This is like a $10,000 watch, which is kind of crazy. We're going to talk about how to buy it cheaper. Um, and uh, the quality is excellent. I, I love the brand. I'm a little fangirl for Rolex, so no apologies there. But the fact of the matter is, is that the design, although it's iconic, has well, it's iconic because it has been copied by every big manza. <laughs> it has been copied by everybody. Uh, thank you, two smoke to stroke with with the uh, two dollars Australian. Thank thank you so much, smoke. Um, I appreciate this, guys. Going to the dog food fund, by the way. Um, this design has been copied by everybody from Invicta to you know, literally anybody who manufactures a watch. I mean, there's an awful lot of Hamiltons and Bulevas and and Chinese brands and and all kinds of uh, garbage that you never heard of. You can get on, you can go on eBay or on um, Amazon.com and buy a watch that looks from a desk from you know like six, eight, ten feet away that looks just like this watch, and you can spend thirty, forty, fifty dollars for it. So. Um, the answer to um, why I go to this one is because it's such a generic looking watch because it has been so widely copied that it doesn't attract attention. And to be very honest, it barely attracts my attention. And that has, for me, has been the key to success in, a, in the last four days. I, I have worn this for four days. Um, I have only taken it off for about two hours because this morning in bed, like early in the morning, I woke up to piddle and this just bothered me rattling around on me. So I just took it off for a couple hours. And then I um, rolled out of bed and just slapped it right back on. So um, I find it actually kind of boring. Now, I have made bunches of videos about my Hulk, which I think that's a dynamically exciting watch. Weird, right? That I would find this boring and the Hulk exciting. Why? Because it's the identical watch literally in every Every, every aspect, it's completely identical with the following exception that the um, the bezel here, which is a black cer ceramic, cerachrome is the um, Rolex's little weirdo buzzword for it. And the dial here is black. Well, on the Hulk, the um, the bezel, the, the ceramic bezel is green and the dial is a sunburst or a sun ray, you know, green, right? Otherwise freaking identical. But because of all that green and because the sun ray um, dial is dynamic. It, when the light hits it, it does, you know, depending on the light, it does different things. So it's, it's an ever-changing watch. It's fascinating, you know, so I stare at it a lot. I think about it a lot. It occupies a lot of, like, my poor little bizarre brain. <laughs> something, guys, I'm sorry, there's something wrong with me. But if you are in this chat room right now, there are 53 of you. And if you are in this chat room right now, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's something wrong with you, too. So kind of glad that we're doing this together. Okay, so I have started to wear this watch because um, it fades into the background of my mind. Once in a while, let me get this near the mic. Hopefully you can hear that. You know, the, the fidget spinner, the click. I mean, the bezel on this Rolex is perfect. Honestly, it is the most perfect bezel. I think they must have studied people's weirdo OCD habits, and they probably discovered that excuse me, that people just love popping like little bubble wrap, but like the little bubbles are somehow weirdly more satisfying even than the, um, than the big bubbles. Right. And so what they emulated with the sound of this thing, it feels and sounds like you're popping teeny bubbles on little itty bitty teeny bubble wrap. <laughs> this is how my brain works. Maybe I should use the super chats for therapy, <laughs> you know, instead of dog food. I don't know. Anyway. Um, uh, this is this is 
yeah, how my mind works is a little frightening, I grant you. But uh, at any rate, so um, other than that, other than playing with it a little bit, it fades into the background of my mind. And I'm not thinking about it constantly because it's it's a beautiful watch, it, you know, and I'm privileged to own it. There's no doubt about that. I don't want to minimize how much it's worth and, you know, and come off like I'm some, you know, rich a-hole because uh, I don't think like that. I, I feel like it's a privilege to, you know, manage to sc scratch together enough disposable income to buy something like this. But, um, you know, I'm still like a value-oriented buyer, so I want to keep having my $5,000, and we will talk about that momentarily too. But uh, to, to conclude, it fades into the background of the consciousness of my mind, so I'm not constantly thinking about it. And so I wanted to go with what I consider to be one of my simpler watches, and that's why I put this on instead of the Hulk, just something that I could forget that I was wearing. <sighs> well... You know, that has worked out pretty well for me because, I, like I said, haven't taken it off in four days. Today is, uh, in, we're now into day five, but beginning of. So um, I, I said it. Oh, this is another OCD habit that I have. I've got this app on the, um, I've got this app, Begmanza. You know, I, I got to do my own Begmanzas now. Begmanza. Gun Glutton. Uh, for two dollars, says buy some TSLA. Well, you, you know, uh, Gun Glutton, you got to tell me what is TSLA, or somebody tell me in the comments. I don't know what. I, sorry, but I don't, I don't know what that is. If it's um, some sort of antipsychotic or anti OCD drug, yeah, I probably, I probably should. Anyway, let me know what that is. Um, so I, um, I have an app. It's called Watchville. Um, and it has different little components of it. I, I like it quite a bit. Um, oh, it's Tesla stock. Yeah, no, Tesla. Yeah, it would be it would probably be smarter of me to buy anything other than watches as an investment. Uh, that's a whole nother can of worms, guys. I value buyer in the sense that I want to retain value. Yes. An investment buyer is somebody who wants to grow value. No, I, I don't. I don't think you're going to, you cannot predictably do that with watches anyway, whereas you can predictably do that in the stock market, particularly with an intelligent buy. So thanks for the suggestion, but I got a guy, okay, because uh, I'm like terrible at that. Anyway, um, I have an app. It's called Watchville. You can read the watch news. So every morning in bed, you know, I load up the phone and I look to see what time it is. And my other habit is, uh, and I have backed down on this next craziness, but there is a... A, a, a watch timer in the Watchville app that you can set your watch by, okay? Because when 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 the second the sweeping second hand hits the fifty five second part, it starts to beep, 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 boop. And on the boop, you're supposed to you know push the crown in because you've hacked the watch and you can completely set it and forget it, <laughs> just just like Ron Popeil. Well, the problem is. The average watch, you cannot set it and forget it. Now, my little cruddy little $30 Casio, you know, when I would set this um, and then check it, it was, there was no change, right? Like I could wear this watch for like an entire week without having to reset the seconds to like, you know, because if it was fast or slow, uh, this thing is off like, I don't know, maybe 1 25th of a second per day, you know, for 30 bucks. So I don't know, guys. I, I don't know why I have all these G-Shocks. I got a bunch of them. I should sell all of them and just keep this one because this is the, the funnest of the lot. But anyway, um, I have this terrible habit of constantly like monitoring my watches to see how they're doing, you know, for timeliness, slow, fast, you know, et cetera. And naturally, as a mechanical watch, you expect all of your mechanical watches to be somewhat off. Um, this is a superlative chronometer, so it should be... Um, Spec for it is minus two plus two. Pretty sure about that. Let me know if I am wrong, but I think I'm right on that. Um, so here's the weirdo thing. This is the nutsy, nutsy cuckoo thing before we talk about price and buying experience. It's uh, it, four days. It Right now, it has gained three quarters of a second grand total in four days. So I can't, I am, I am incapable of doing that math by myself. So let's, let's, let's fire up the uh, iPhone calculator and let's say what is 0.75, three quarters of a second divided by four, that is 0.1875. So let's call it 0.19. So it's not even a 
quarter second a day. It's under a quarter second per day that it, and it's running slightly fast, not slow, but slightly fast, which is like fantastic. I, I don't know about you guys, but I would really rather have a watch running five or six seconds fast per day than one running one second slow per day, you know, cause you just hack it. Um, and then wait till the boop that I was telling you about on the Watchville app. And then, um, you know, unhack it and you're, you're good to go. Whereas if you have a watch that's running even a little bit slow, especially if you're OCD about it, you know, you have to hack it at the 12, adjust the minutes to the following minute that's upcoming and then unhack it right at the boop. So ugh, that's just takes up a lot more time and effort. I would really rather yeah, have a watch running fast. And this one is running like as close to dead bang on as I could humanly imagine a mechanical watch running. It's weird. I don't even understand it. Um, I don't remember it running this this well when I put it away and didn't touch it for months because I got bored with it. Um, but I, you know, there are a lot of guys who say that what they do is they just um, update their watches once a week every other week or once a month, you know, in terms of like, you know, hacking and getting it correct. And I'm thinking to myself, who are, who are these people? <laughs> who, who are these incredibly sane, normal, boring, horrible people who wait, you know, for like hours, you know, weeks, and then check the timeliness of their watch and update them? Oh, hell no. I'm lucky if I don't do it. Honestly, I probably do it three times per day. Bruce Williams, thank you for joining us. You would like to know if I have a time grapher, and the answer is I don't. Um, but I know that um, I see all the time that um, Rob has one. Um, I, you probably have one too. That's the thing where you put the watch, you set the watch into it, and it listens for the heartbeat, and it goes tick, 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 amplifies the tick, and it gives you the amplitude of the watch. It tells you if it's running fast or slow. Um, I, I don't have one of those, Bruce, and I really need to not buy one. <laughs> Because I will, I will check every watch. I will sit in front of the thing. I will print out the graphs to zero, to zero benefit. And the reason why there's zero benefit on me owning, owning a time grapher is because um, I can't open the case back and adjust the watch. Um, and even if I could, I shouldn't. I mean, like, you, you know, there are very few, like, little, there are very few watch jobs that I should be allowed to do. And any of them that I am allowed to do, or that I allow myself to do, that I trust myself to do, any of them are contained in this adorable little toolkit that I got for like 15 bucks off of eBay. I recommend that every watch crazy watch person have one. Um, and it has spring bars and all the little fixtures and all the little screwdrivers, you know, all the junk that you that you need to change bands and, you know, mess around with a watch, but it does, and it does have a case back opener, but, um, oh my God, <laughs> you know, I'm pretty sure like when I was a kid, once I tried working on my car and I had extra parts, <laughs> I didn't know where they went. I didn't. So, and you know what? The car started and ran. So I just threw them in the back of the vehicle. 1965 Ford country squire sedan. If you've ever had one, then you're having a little quiver right now, you know, making the sign of the cross and the toy, 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 the sign of the evil eye, because it was a, it was a horrible thing. Anyway, this watch is running like as close to dead bang on right now as, as a, I can imagine a mechanical watch running. So I want to talk to you though, the whole point of this video, I've been rambling and waffling, forgive me. The whole point of this thing was, you know, the buying experience. So I went on uh, David SW just now to check and just see like what's a second hand full set going for. And um, let me have another quick look because you know what I didn't verify was that this is a full set. I'm a t I would imagine for this price, it should be. Yeah, it, it, it appears to be a full set. And um, yes, yes, this is a full set. And David SW has this sub full set for $12,975. And, well, $12, and it's, you know, this is, it's the same watch as mine, although I don't know the year. Um, I don't want to kind of read through this a lot. This one is a 2012. And um, the one on David SW, it, you know, my guess for that price is that it's a far newer, it's a far newer one, although it's an identical watch. Um, <clears throat> I could check Bob's watches. I could check Chrono 24. But um, anyway, so 
for whatever reason, David SW has something very much like this full set up for, call it $13,000. Guys, help me out in the comments right now. What is retail for it? Um, I don't remember exact current retail. I want to say it, it I think I think I'm going to be in the ballpark here. Is it nine thousand fifty dollars US? The um, the the Rolex date ceramic. I think so. It's around nine grand. I think, um, and you know, then you have sales tax uh, in in the UK and other parts of the world. You have VAT. Um, Watches and giggles says it's eighty nine ninety five. Okay, so it's nine grand plus you have tax. So and I'll tell you, my local tax is really high. Illinois is nuts. So nine thousand dollars. Plus, um, well, hang on. No one ever said I was good at math. Times 1.09 is $9,810. So $9,810 would be full retail, including tax here for a new one. Um, but where they have gone used has varied a lot over the last year or so. But lately, lately they're going, again, over retail. Now, I'm sure you could find somebody selling it under retail, but I just want to say it's like not an uncommon proposition to be paying over retail right now or premium, even for just a straight up black sub. Guys, I paid $8,500 for this watch, box and papers. Uh, I don't have the hang tag, but, uh, but full set. Okay, let's just call it a full set. I might even have the hang tag. I should look. Um, but I do know it's the uh, it's the box and the the warranty card and the booklets and I paid eight thousand five hundred dollars for it, and I didn't buy this three four five years ago. I bought this less than a year ago. I guess probably um, I would guess right now it would be maybe six or eight months ago is when I got this thing. Eight thousand five hundred dollars. Now I'm going to tell you what's wrong with it, um, and I'm going to tell you what's right with it. But first I got to fix the bezel because I was playing with that. And I don't want to hurt anybody's OCD. Okay, so here it is. There are no giant scratches, gonks, dings, etc. Everything's good. Um, it has the bead blasted. Uh, it's got this bead blasted internal clasp here. Now, some of you who are not super familiar with Rolex and you know their finishing and what year was what, you might worry that oh, it's a fake. Well, it's not a fake. Um, in in, in 2012, they were bead blasting this because they considered it a tool watch. And then uh, I don't know what year it happened, but they started high polishing it because they decided it was a luxury watch. So that's what happened there. Um, so it is, it's definitely period correct. Um, now, how did I do it? So first of all, oh, and another thing it has, I have a three year, a three year warranty on manufacturing defects on the watch. Okay. Now, I bought it on eBay. So let me tell you how I did it. Um, the, the first thing is when I saw it come up, and I, I don't remember, honestly, I don't remember what the asking price of the watch was, okay? But I know it wasn't $8,500. It was higher than that. Now, I think right now, by the way, we're in this very weird spot where Rolex prices are rising when I think they should be coming down. Maybe it's a little bit of hype because we're just at the point where, um, you know, today is September, or excuse me, August 12, 2020. 2020, ooh, what a year. <laughs> Hopefully 2021 will be better. But in a, just a couple of weeks, Rolex is going to be making their uh, 2021 announcements. What are they, you know, what are they introducing? What are they changing, et cetera? What are their prices? What's happening? What's happening in Rolex is going to be all revealed um, in early September. By the way, I made a um, uh, Mark Goldberg predicts Rolex 2020 video, so you might have a look at that. Um, that that is up now. But at any rate, um, what I'm what I wanted to mention here is that this had a higher price. Now I know it wasn't high as high as what uh, I just showed you online with David SW at almost thirteen thousand dollars. But I don't think David's crazy. And why do I say that? Because there has been this spike um, and a uh, rising tide lifts all boats. So he is not the only, the only person selling, you know, a Submariner in that price range right now. No, not by any stretch. I think you'll find it kind of consistent for uh, uh, the high class retail, you know, really trusted source. You know, they, they stand behind these watches for years and um, you know, service them and stuff. So anyway, my eBay seller, the first thing I did was I looked at what, what the price was and um, let's just say it was eleven thousand dollars. 
I don't remember, but it was it would have been somewhere between ten and eleven thousand dollars. That would have been their asking price online on eBay. So the very first thing I did was I wanted to look at who is this seller. That is the first thing I do when I'm looking to purchase on eBay. So um, I looked at the um, I looked at the um, I looked at the seller, and they had a lot of feedbacks. I mean, like couple few thousand. I don't remember the precise number, but it wasn't somebody with like 15, 20, 30, 40 um, pieces of feedback. It was in the thousands of feedback. And then, you know, you can click the about the seller. Um, and I did. And it turned out, <clears throat> excuse me, guys, <clears throat> it turned out that the seller is a, a, a chain of jewelry stores in like Kentucky and Ohio. And I forget how many bricks and mortar stores they have, but it's like three, four, five, something like that. So it's a small family run chain. Um, and they commonly also sell on eBay. So it's a bricks and mortar store. They were offering a three-year warranty and defects, you know, three, three year guarantee on the watch. And uh, they had the, and this is critical. They had the buy it now button enabled. Now you have various kinds of sellers on eBay. I was buying from an eBay seller, someone who commonly sells on eBay. That's somebody who I would be interested in trying to do business with. But then you have private party people, and you can tell just by looking at who they are, what their feedback is. Um, and I like those guys too, but I'm going to come back to the, to the big sellers, to the bricks and mortar guy selling on eBay, or maybe a guy who's a, an eBay power seller with 15,000 pieces of feedback, you know, who only does eBay. And I want to real quick talk about private party guys. Private party guys fall into two categories. One are kind of like scambos who just created the account. I'm not interested in buying from them. Or maybe they have feedback, but it's you know very low feedback of um, 15 or 20. Um, I'm probably not interested in them either, particularly when I go to read about what they've sold in the past. And if it was tube socks, t-shirts, and comic books, well, you know, maybe they just were setting up that account to scam somebody on a on a on a on an expensive Rolex. So I'm not interested in them. But there are some people like me who have, you know, 100, 200, I've got 200 pieces of feedback and they're collectors and you can tell, you know, you can tell they're collectors and they've just gotten to the point with a watch where they just want to oh, I, I I need this gone for my sanity. Um, now I'm going to make an, a, a whole other video about that experience because that is precisely how I bought my Sky Dweller for not only zero premium, but under retail. Okay. So I'm going to another video about that buying experience, but we're going to get right back to the Submariner guy with a couple thousand pieces of feedback asking between 10 and $11,000 for the watch. And the watch was naked. Okay. Wasn't, it was not box and papers. I really wanted a box and papers one. And I thought if I'm going to buy a naked one, I'm going to steal it. I mean, I am going to, I'm just going to come through like a, you know, like a hurricane and I'm just going to steal this thing or I don't want it. Um, and the reason is, is it's so much harder to unload a Rolex that doesn't have box and papers. Why? Because you people and my, <laughs> and me too, we are obsessively weird and we want the box, the papers, the hang tags, the booklets, the plastic. We want the plastic that's been ripped off you know, and we want the outer box. We want the receipt. I mean, I saved the shopping bags that, you know, that either came with my watches from the AD or, um, you know, that I've bought from my own AD. I, I literally save every little piece. If there's any swag that they gave me, I throw it in the, in the shopping bag. Okay. So we're, re we're, we are weirdos like that. We want all that junk. And if I'm buying one, that's just like watch only wrapped up in bubble wrap, <laughs> you know, sent to me in a, you know, in a, in a box, then um, I need to buy it cheap enough as to where I can unload it to somebody else uh, who wants to watch, but is willing to take a good price, um, you know, because I don't have all the accoutrement. So I have the, the mindset that I've got to steal this thing. So I hit the buy it now offer and I make an offensive offer. Now, that's my style. I like to be, make an offensive offer. But you got to be a little careful with your offensive offer. And I don't mean because you're likely to offend them and they're going to get emotional. You don't know. No, I view this as just a math problem, right? But what I wanted to, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> what I was looking to accomplish, let me do a little bit. Let me take a swig. What I was looking to accomplish with my offensive offer was I was trying to figure out 
did they have auto reject enabled? And what I mean by auto reject is, <clears throat> let's say you put an item up on eBay as the seller for $10,000. And you don't even want to be bothered looking at rejecting, negotiating with people coming in at less than $9,000. So you can just say re auto reject everything below $8,999 and then it'll just give you a, a screw you message on eBay, you know? And I just wanted to see, is that what was going to happen or was some human being going to review the thing, which is really what I was looking for. So I put in my offensive offer. Um, they were asking, let's say they were asking $10,000. What was an offensive offer? I think I would have offered like seven. Now, why would I offer four, three, six, two, you know, because it's just stupid. I want to communicate with my offer. Um, you know, look, I'm offensive. I'm out of line, but I know it. Okay. I know it. I don't want to offer something that where they just want to hit the reject button and go, this guy is a complete idiot. I want them to look and go, man, eh, maybe I can work with this guy. Maybe, you know, maybe I can, uh, maybe I can get him to see, you know, reality a little bit better. So, um, what I got back was a um, was an answer. I mean, it was not immediate, but I, I got back an answer. And it was a counter offer. I love I love when I get a counter offer. I mean, I just love when I get a counter offer because then now we have a negotiation. Now I, I hate those auto rejects, but you know when I get a when I get a when I get a counter offer, you know we can kind of like dig in. And the counter offer wasn't very good. You know they came down from let's call it that ten thousand dollar point to like ninety. $350. But there was movement in there and I and that made me smell a little bit of blood. <laughs> so I upped my offer and then we just went back and forth and finally I submitted my la my last offer of $8500 and you can put a note along with, you know, the um you put a note, you know, a message in with your offer. And what I did was I um, I just put a note in there and I said, um, sadly, this is the top, you know, of the line of what I can offer at $8,500 for a naked watch. Uh, but I really appreciate your spending the time on this. Just a nice little thing to take it, you know, to take the uh, emotions down and let them understand, like, like if there's somebody on the other end of this transaction, and there was, um, who is like getting all heated up and riled up. Like, let me just throw a little oil on the waters, calm things down a little. And, and this is commonly something that I do. I learned that tactic from the Japanese sellers on eBay, because if they won't, if they can't take your offer, if they won't take your offer, they're apologetic. They're polite. They're sweet. They're super nice. And uh, they thank you for having made an offer, even if, you know, they can't accept it. Uh, whereas an American vendor is likely to tell you, Hey, you know, go, go jump off a cliff. Um, okay. So, um, little, yeah, they accepted it. Boop. You know, they, <clears throat> they accepted it. <clears throat> oh, I should have said, I also put in my message. I will pay you instantly because you can, you know, it's just pushing some buttons. You have a week to pay, but why would you take a week to pay? When, when you just like boop, hit the button. Um, and I know because sometimes I sell on eBay, um, it, it leaves an open, you know, a, an open checkbox, um, if you know that something has been purchased uh, but not paid for. Now, I know that big sellers like the guy I was dealing with, they have software for this, but nonetheless, it's really nice if the, just the checkbox gets checked right away. So I paid instantly. And um, and then the next day, this was all pretty late at night. And then the next day, I, I just wrote an email thanking them for the transaction and asking when I could expect shipping. And I heard back from a woman who was their eBay sales manager who said, um, can you give us one extra day for shipping, we think that we might actually have box and papers on this watch. And I thought to myself, hmm, well, that would be phenomenal. But if I were her, I would cancel the sale, which they could have, you know, because they could have said, this is not as described, not available for sale as described. I might have lodged a complaint, but, you know, they had, they had some pretty good feedback. So I don't, I don't think it would have really affected them very much. Um, so my response was certainly take your time, you know, just let me know what happens when you get a moment. 24 hours later, she said, we made a mistake in the listing and this box has, this this watch is complete with box and papers and we're going to send you the entire. <laughs> so that's what happened. They sent me the entire the entire thing, box and papers, which I, I was, so $8,500 box and papers. Now, that's all the good news. If there's any bad news, I don't think it's particularly bad, but I will tell you what um, what, what what the bad news is. Um, 
so the first thing is when I you, you're not going to be able to see it here. You know, I, I think you'll find it very very hard to see here. But when I um, opened and inspected the watch because I've handled lots and lots and lots of these watches. What I could see is that it had been, I, I don't want to use the word polished. I, I'm going to say polished. It had been polished, but normally, and it, and it had, and it was not polished well, but luckily I think it was polished with a buffing wheel. It wasn't polished with anything real abrasive. I could tell that because the lug points are still sharp. Um, Nothing has really lost its edge. The bezel has lost maybe, you know, when, when you touch a Rolex Submariner bezel, man, you can feel the, 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 the knife-like edge on every one of these little serrations. There's like a knife-like edge and you can feel it. It has a very, very specific feel. Um, and this is knocked down from that, but only 5%, very, very little. So, um, and just by, and it has little swirly marks on it, but only if I look very close. I mean, I need to put a loop on it um, or high magnification with my iPhone. And then I can see where they didn't even remove the bracelet. They just kind of, but I think they used one of those white buffing wheels with a little tiny dot of some compound, not very abrasive at all. So if if I were to put this in the hands of like the average Joe, I don't think they would think twice about it, especially considering its age. You know, this is an eight year old watch, which is running dead bang on. I don't even know if the, the seller serviced it or they didn't service it. All I know is I got three years warranty on it. So if it starts running crazy, you know, I can return it and they'll, and I verified them that I said, you know, if it's running way out of spec, will you fix it? And they said, Oh yeah, you got a guarantee. So if it's in spec, no. But if it starts to run way out of spec, send it back. I, I was so thrilled with that. Um, so again, if I were to show this watch to like the average Joe, like a normal human being, which we are not, there are 124 of you in this room and not a single one of you is a normal person or you would not be in this room talking to me, you know, on this level about watches. Okay. So, but again, you could give this to a normal person and they would see, they would detect no worries, no problem with it. I see the difference between it and a brand spanking new one. Um, but what it isn't is beat up. It's not beat up. There's no big scratch, no gunks, no dings. No, there's nothing wrong with it. Now, if I wanted to go to the ends of the OCD earth, I would send this off to somebody for a little bit of um, finish restoration because the finish can, in fact, be restored on even a really goofed up case or bracelet. Now, it's really hard to add back metal that has been removed. So, you know, if the shape of the lugs has been substantially screwed up, well, then you have to really think about whether you want to restore it or not, because now you're talking about laser welding and it gets expensive and nuts. And is a laser welded watch original or isn't it? You know, you get into all these philosophical nutsy cuckoo questions that I would prefer to avoid. But what I would say is... Um, this has not been damaged in that way. It's just to the eye, you know, looks 10% different than what a new one should. Um, now, in the same vein, once I bought off of eBay, boy, I should have kept it. <laughs> I should have kept it. I bought a 40 millimeter Explorer 2 um, that came just, uh, it was a mess. Someone had put that thing on a buffing wheel and used a grinder to like just smooth everything out. And it was just awful. Um, it was original. It was authentic. Um, excuse me, guys. But it was just, the finish on it was wrong. And I remember sending it to jewelers on time, Kenny Nguyen, because it took them a lot of time and money to get that equipment together, you know, and it's not about the money, it's their passion. And I sent that Explorer to, Polar Explorer, in fact, sent that off to Kenny Nguyen, and I said, do what you can with it. And he said, yeah, no problem. And I honestly had very, very low expectations for that watch. Um, because like, what could he do? The, the matte finish on, you know, the, 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 the matte finish on the steel was like smooth, but it was smooth with striations or marks or lines where like somebody had just put it on a belt sander. You know, it, it was just not nice. And, uh, like a month later it came back to me and honest to God, guys, it looked factory new. It was uncanny. I like, it was, it was amazing. It was just amazing. Um, it looked absolutely factory new. So I, Kenny has got some very, very, very talented people who are really good at restoring hand finishing. And um, this was, I don't know, like four or five years ago. But I can tell you, my experience was really good. So I thought about sending this off 
Oh, and, and the price, you know, honestly, I don't remember the exact price. I think the case finishing costs one thing and the bracelet costs another, but I think maybe it cost me around $90 to finish that bracelet. And I don't remember what for the case, um, but like, that's crazy. That's like so good. So I thought about calling up Kenny. Um, I'm still in touch with him. Great guy. Um, and, and seeing, you know, could not, could he, cause I know he could, the question would be how much. And then I thought, no, 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 no. I need to stop. I, I like, I, I got a full set current production model, not for long, but right now as of today, current production run you know, watch that is on David SW right now for $13,000, just about. And I got it for $8,500. And now I want to put more money into it and make it perfect. If I make it perfect, I'm going to look at it every day for scratches. And I need to not do that. What I need to do is to be able to just wear it and enjoy it and not think about it too much. So that's what I'm doing. So I guess here's the moral of the story. Um, avoid when, by all means, you can be an eBay buyer. Now, being an eBay seller, I have made videos about that. That is a lot dicier. Being an eBay seller is a lot safer. So I'm just going to kind of wrap this up by giving you a bit of advice on you know, how to buy safely on eBay. Look at the seller and avoid accounts that are relatively new. Look at the seller and pick somebody who has a lot of really good feedback and buy a lot. I mean, if you're a newbie at this, I would go with sellers who have like 500 or more uh, feedback, right? If you're if you're a if you're not a newbie and if you've got some eBay sophistication, then you know look for these guys with a hundred or more. Because a lot of collectors buy and sell and trade and just get tired of something and sell it off on eBay. And you know they're not constantly on eBay, but they're honorable people and with a good product. Buying from collectors is great, by the way, because typically collectors just get tired of stuff and then they want to just clean out the box, and so they just put stuff up on eBay and, and they just want to get rid of it. So I bought lots of stuff from individual collectors with, you know, not a lot of feedback, but when you're buying an expensive piece, you know, it's pretty important that you get it authenticated. Now in the comments of this video right here, some of the live live stream guys, you know, made mention of the fact that there are, um, there are counterfeit box and papers. Um, and that is true. Um, you, you, you can, you can buy a you can buy a counterfeit box. You can you can go on eBay and you can buy a real box for one hundred and fifty dollars. Um, you can buy counterfeit papers. Um, or some of these really high end counterfeit watches come with you know fake box and papers. So, box and papers keeps you a lot safer. Yes, but um, there is some slim chance that those could be counterfeit. So you want to authenticate your stuff when you have bought it on eBay, and you want to do it relatively quickly. Why? eBay offers terrific protections for sellers. Ooh, excuse me. eBay offers terrific protections for buyers. Metza, mm, metza, not so good for the seller, but they have good, good, um, they have good protection for the buyer. And um, so when you buy off of eBay, you pay via PayPal, also owned by eBay, not so coincidentally. They get you coming and going, don't they, guys? Anyway, you get eBay protection, you get PayPal protection. It, it's you're pretty safe, but you want to get your stuff authenticated. And so if I buy a piece off of eBay, then the first thing I do when it arrives is I get it over to, like if it's a Rolex, I want to take it over to my authorized dealer and I want to have them do an insurance appraisal. Now, Clyde talked a lot about um, getting watches authenticated at the AD. And some of them, if they like you, they'll do it free. They'll look at the thing and go, yeah, it looks real to me. But that that's not paperwork. What you really want is ideally paperwork. So um, the and in fact, honestly, when you buy something expensive like a diamond ring, diamond earrings, you know, present for your girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever. When you buy expensive stuff from a bricks and mortar jeweler, it's very typical that they're going to provide you with an insurance appraisal free, so that you just throw it over to your insurance agent. If you're buying the insurance appraisal as an add-on item, like you know, I didn't buy this ring here, but can you in give me an insurance appraisal for your expert opinion as a gemologist? The answer is yes, they can do it. They're certified to do that. And depending on where you are and your relationship with them um, and what their set price is, it's going to price up seventy-five to hundred. $125, something like that. And um, so, but if you've just bought something off of eBay for seven, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars $10,000, it's really well worth. Box and papers are no, it's really well worth getting over to your AD very quickly and asking for an insurance appraisal. 
Okay. Um, I think it's especially important, by the way, if you bought something naked, because this way um, you can, um, when you know, you could sell it with with that paper. Okay. So that's what I've got for you today, guys. Um, patience, patience, patience. I stalked Submariners for months before I found one seller who was just like, let's just get this out the door. Final thought. Why would they sell it for that? Here's what you don't know. And here's what you're probing and testing for, like a dentist looking for a rotten tooth in your mouth. What you're looking for is the, the, the pawn shop, the seller, the jewelry store who bought this secondhand cheap. Cheap. If they took $8,500 from me, they probably ripped somebody off for six grand and they probably made $2,500 on this piece. So if I sell this thing myself, will I go for 13000 or will I say, mm, you know, I paid 8500 for it. Why don't I take 9500 for it? And I've made a bargain. You know, I've made a profit. So what your seller paid for the watch, that's something you're never really going to know. But this is what you're looking for is somebody who paid low enough as to where your offensive offer can kind of get noodled and jiggled and negotiated to a place where he is still going to make a profit, just not, you know, as much. But time is money. And sometimes people are willing to just say, if you'll pay me right now, I'll take my money and run. Guys, I'm going to take my money and run. Thank you for having joined me. Goldberg, let's do this again. Peace out.